Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2024. Welcome to lesson number 10, Spiritualism Exposed. Ready for teaching on June 8, the author of the series of lessons on the Great Controversy is Pastor Mark Finlay, and your reader this week is Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, June 1. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word today speaks to us, as it did so long ago to the disciples We thank you that your word speaks to us as it did through the life of Jesus, as he reflected the word that was before him in the Old Testament. And Lord, as we open your word this week, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be here to guide and to bless. Lord, we today would like to pray for Liddy Palmas and her needs and Mara Francis and Nonlandla Mbengenji and Chris Tech. Lord, each of these has their own needs, and I don't know what they are, but you do. And I pray that you'll bless them. Bless each of our listeners, whether they're sighted or not sighted, whether English is their first language or whether they're learning English by reading the Sabbath school lesson in sync with the audio. Lord, I pray for each of them, and particularly for those who are struggling with spiritism, because our lesson this week is on spiritism. It's titled Spiritualism Exposed. And as we open your word, we thank you that in your word there are not only warnings but guides for us to help us when we face this issue. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Let's read that again. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Decades ago, stories surfaced about near-death experiences in DEs, in which people who died and were then revived gave incredible accounts of what they had seen and heard while dead. Millions now believe that these accounts are evidence that the dead are not really dead. This foundational belief of spiritualism is one of Satan's most widespread and effective deceptions. In fact, spiritualism began back in Eden with the serpent's lie to Eve. You will not surely die in Genesis 3 verse 4. This idea also lay at the root of one of the greatest spurious religious movements of the 19th century, with the Fox sisters' claim, later admitted to be fraudulent, that they could receive answers to their questions from spirits of the dead. The aim of this lesson is to show that our only safeguard against Satan's last-day delusions is a personal relationship with Christ and a solid grounding in the teachings of the Bible. This includes its teaching about death, regardless of what our eyes and ears and hearts might try to tell us. Sunday, June 2, The Deadly Consequences of Spiritualism The fable that death is really just entrance to a new stage of life is based on the concept of the soul's natural immortality. 
This pagan idea infiltrated the church early on as it moved away from its biblical foundations in an attempt to make its faith understandable to the wider Roman world. Ellen White writes in The Great Controversy, page 549, the theory of the immortality of the soul was one of those false doctrines that Rome, borrowing from paganism, incorporated into the religion of Christendom, end of quote. Matthew 10 verse 28 reads, And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. What should this verse alone tell us about the supposed immortality of the soul? Let's read it again. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 10, 28. The Lord forbade his people from involvement in occultism of any kind. They were not to tolerate among them a medium or a spiritist or one who calls up the dead, as we read in Deuteronomy 18, verse 11. I'll read this from the New International Version or cast spells, or who is a medium or spiritist, or who consults the dead. Such people were to be stoned to death, we read in Leviticus 20, verse 27. A man or woman who is a medium or spiritist among you must be put to death. You are to stone them, their blood will be on their own heads. The punishment seems incredibly harsh, but It was designed to protect Israel from worshipping false gods. Witchcraft is demonic. It seduces people into false worship and counterfeits a genuine relationship with God, but it can never satisfy the deepest needs of the heart. Spiritualism is at the heart of Satan's plan to take the world captive. But Jesus, by his grace and power, sets captives free from the chains of evil that bind them. Read Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5, Job 7, verses 7 to 9, and Isaiah 8, verses 19 and 20. What do these Bible passages teach us about death and communication with the dead? First of all, Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, and even their name is forgotten. And Job 7, beginning at verse 7, Remember, O God, that my life is but a breath. My eyes will never see happiness again. The eye that now sees me will see me no longer. You will look for me, but I will be no more. As a cloud vanishes and is gone, so one who goes down to the grave does not return. And Isaiah 8, beginning at verse 19. When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. If anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Though unbiblical, the belief that the dead go right to heaven at death has been around for so long and so firmly entrenched that it's very difficult for people to let go of it. People use a few texts that are taken out of context to try to justify the belief. But this false teaching leaves them with no protection against the deceptions Satan can foist on them, especially in the final crisis. And so to finish the day, what has been your experience with trying to explain the state of the dead to other Christians? What, if anything, have you found effective? Monday, June 3, Death in the Old Testament. 
Read Psalm 6 verse 5, Psalm 115 verse 17, 1 Kings 2.10, 1 Kings 11.43 and 1 Kings 14.20. What do these verses teach about the state of the dead? First of all, Psalm 6 verse 5, Among the dead no one proclaims your name. Who praises you from the grave? Psalm 115 verse 17, it is not the dead who praise the Lord, those who go down to the place of silence. 1 Kings 2.10 Then David rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. And 1 Kings 11.43 Then he rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David his father, and Rehoboam his son succeeded him as king. And first Kings fourteen verse twenty he reigned for twenty two years and then rested with his ancestors, and Nadab his son succeeded him as king. The Old Testament does not teach the immortality of the soul, nor does it teach that after death the faithful soar off to the bliss of heaven for eternity, and the unfaithful descend to hell where they burn for eternity. It teaches that death is asleep. The book of Kings uses the expression they rested or slept with their fathers to describe the death of the patriarchs. The Psalms call it the sleep of death, as you read in Psalm 13, verse 3. Look at me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes and I will sleep in death. And Psalm 90 and verse 5, yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. Referring to death, Job speaks of not awaking from sleep in Job 14 verse 12. So he lies down and does not rise till the heavens are no more. People will not awake or be roused from their sleep. The psalmist says, As for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. When the Assyrian army was defeated and destroyed, the death of the soldiers is called their final sleep, as we read in Psalm 76 verse 6, At your rebuke, God of Jacob, both horse and chariot, lie still. The idea of the dead as disembodied spirits hovering around to communicate with the living is not a biblical concept at all, but pure paganism. A failure to understand the truth about death leaves us open to the deceptions of Satan. In the Great Controversy, page 560, we read, Many will be confronted by the spirits of devils personating beloved relatives or friends and declaring the most dangerous heresies. These visitants will appeal to our tenderest sympathies and will work miracles to sustain their pretensions. We must be prepared to withstand them with the Bible truth that the dead know not anything and that they who thus appear are the spirits of devils. End of quote. Read Daniel chapter 12 verse 2 and Job 19 verse 25 and 26. What elements about the state of the dead are added by these verses? Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. And Job 19, beginning at verse 25, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. Death is a rest in sleep until the resurrection. There are no disembodied spirits hovering around to communicate with the living. Although the pagans believed in a spirit world, the Israelites understood death as a sleep until resurrection morning. Though we mourn for the dead, think this way about those who die in Christ. They close their eyes in death 
And then, regardless of how long it takes until Jesus returns, the next thing they know is the second coming. The first thought they might have at the resurrection is, wow, Jesus really did come back soon after all. Tuesday, June 4, Death in the New Testament. Read John 11, verses 11 to 14, and verses 21 to 25, 2 Timothy 1.10, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 54, and 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 15 to 17. How do the New Testament writers' descriptions of death compare with those in the Old Testament? John 11, beginning at verse 11. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And then verse 21 onwards, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And then 2 Timothy 1 and verse 10. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Saviour Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. And 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 51. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. And then 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning at verse 15. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord for ever. Both the Old and New Testaments use the symbolism of death as a sleep. At least 53 times in the Bible, the word sleep is equated with death. The Bible writers concur that there is no conscious existence in an immortal soul that leaves the body immediately after death. The New Testament adds another dimension, one already hinted at in the Old, the glorious resurrection at Christ's return. The Gospels emphasise that eternal life is in Christ alone. All the demons in hell cannot rob believers of their assurance of eternal life. Christ conquered death on the cross. The grave can no longer hold its victims. Christ's resurrection is the guarantee that all believers will one day be resurrected from the grave at his return. Look at these words in Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 16 to 18. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. 
How does one make any sense of these verses if the dead, at death, already are in the bliss of heaven? What does Paul mean that they have perished if, in fact, they already are in heaven? Instead, Paul's whole point is that Christ's resurrection is the foundation of our resurrection and that without the resurrection, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins and the dead remain in the ground, perished. These verses fit in perfectly with other Bible texts about the hope we have in the resurrection at Jesus' return when we will receive the inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, as recorded in 1 Peter 1 verse 4. If, however, the dead already are in heaven, why does Paul speak of an inheritance reserved in heaven for us? Clearly, New Testament believers eagerly looked forward to the coming of Christ and the resurrection of the dead, and this hope inspired them to faithfulness in the trials of life. And so to finish the day, why is the resurrection such a powerful hope for the Christian faith? What if we had the cross but no resurrection? What hope would we have? Why then is the resurrection such an important part of our faith? Wednesday, June 5, Spiritualism in the Last Days, Part 1. Read Matthew chapter 24, verses 5, 11 and 24. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 7 to 9, Revelation 13, 13 and 14, and Revelation 16, verses 13 and 14. What kind of deceptions will people face in the last days? So we start with Matthew 24, verse 5, For many will come in my name, claiming, I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. And verse 11, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. And verse 24, for false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. And Second Thessalonians 2, beginning at verse 7, for the secret powers of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. And Revelation 13, beginning at verse 13, And it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Because of the signs, it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast it deceived, the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in honour of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived, in Revelation 16, beginning at verse 13. Then I saw three impure spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are demonic spirits that perform signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle of the great day of God Almighty. The devil will use signs and wonders and spectacular miracles to deceive multitudes just before the coming of Jesus. Commenting on the deceptive power of demonic spirits, Angel Rodriguez, one of our top Bible students and theologians, makes this telling statement, and it comes from the closing of the cosmic conflict role of the three angels' messages by Angel Rodriguez. Their power of persuasion is to be found not in the content of their message, but in the power of supernatural manifestations called signs or miracles. 
They perform or do, or P-O-I-E-O in Greek, signs, thus appealing to the effective side of human beings rather than to their discretionary and rational abilities. The fact that these signs are performed by demons shows that the unifying force of the message of the three demons, dragon, beast and false prophet, is spiritualistic in nature. God is not their source of origin. As the cosmic conflict approaches its closure, demonic power will enter the arena of human history in an unprecedented way. Spiritualism, whose very foundation is the non-biblical teaching of the immortality of the soul, will nearly take the world captive. End of quote. Why is it dangerous to trust our emotions? What roles do they play, good and bad, in our faith experience? How might Satan bypass our thinking processes and appeal to our feelings? We read in The Great Controversy, page 561 and 562. Satan has long been preparing for his final effort to deceive the world. Little by little, he has prepared the way for his masterpiece of deception in the development of spiritualism. He has not yet reached the full accomplishment of his designs, but it will be reached in the last remnant of time. Except those who are kept by the power of God through faith in his word, the whole world will be swept into the ranks of this delusion. The people are fast being lulled to a fatal security, to be awakened only by the outpouring of the wrath of God. End of quote. Our sole security is in Jesus and his word, It's not hard to see how millions, even billions, who do not understand the state of the dead could be swept away by delusions involving the idea that the dead live on after death. And so to finish today, even now, what are some common deceptions that those who understand that the dead sleep are protected from? Thursday, June 6, Spiritualism in the Last Days, Part 2 Our hope of salvation is rooted in Christ. His blood-stained hands beckon us to accept the sacrifice so freely provided at infinite cost. Soon, Christ will return to claim his own. Titus 2.13 calls the second coming of Christ the Blessed Hope. Satan's goal is to destroy this hope. He will perform miracles, signs and wonders, anything and everything that could lead people away from Bible truth and salvation in Christ. Revelation 14.12 says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. In the final struggle, Satan is going to do all that he can to prevent people from either keeping the commandments of God or having the faith of Jesus, or both. Hence, the need to be careful of any teaching that, even if accompanied by signs, wonders and miracles, would turn us away from either of these two characteristics of the remnant. Read Matthew 24, verses 23 to 27, 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 and 14, and 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 to 12. What do these passages tell us about Satan's deceptive power and manner of working? Matthew 24, beginning at verse 23. At that time, if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you ahead of time. So, if anyone tells you, there he is, out in the wilderness, do not go out. Or, here he is, in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For, as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the sun of man. And 2 Corinthians 11, beginning at verse 13. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ, 
And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. And 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 9 to 12. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. In the last moments of time, Satan will enact his final deception. From the Great Controversy, we read on page 624, Fearful sights of a supernatural character will soon be revealed in the heavens, in token of the power of miracle-working demons. The spirits of devils will go forth to the kings of the earth and to the whole world to fasten them in deception and urge them on to unite with Satan in his last struggle against the government of heaven. By these agencies, rulers and subjects will be alike deceived. Persons will arise pretending to be Christ himself and claiming the title and worship which belong to the world's Redeemer. They will perform wonderful miracles of healing and will profess to have revelations from heaven contradicting the testimonies of the Scriptures. As the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. The Church has long professed to look to the Saviour's advent as the consummation of her hopes. The great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. In different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness, resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in the Revelation, in Revelation 1, verses 13 to 15. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair of his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. End of quote. And so to finish the day, why is understanding the truth about how Christ returns, as well as the state of the dead, so important in order not to be deceived? Friday, June 7. Further Thought A recent book by Lee Strobel, The Case for Heaven, is premised on the idea that, at death, the dead remain alive in some kind of conscious existence with near-death experiences, NDEs, being used as part of the proof. One example... And he writes, another girl who had an NDE during her heart surgery said she met her brother in the afterlife, which surprised her because she didn't have a brother. When she later recovered and told her father, he revealed to her for the first time that she did indeed have a brother, but he had died before she was born. Strobel struggles, however, to harmonise the idea of an immediate afterlife with the clear biblical teaching that only when Christ returns do Christians receive their final reward. We have been warned in The Great Controversy, page 560, many will be confronted by the spirits of devils personating beloved relatives or friends and declaring the most dangerous heresies. These visitants will appeal to our tenderest sympathies and will work miracles to sustain their pretensions. We must be prepared to withstand them with the Bible truth that the dead know not anything and that they who thus appear are the spirits of devils. 
just before us is the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell on the earth. Revelation 3.10 All whose faith is not firmly established upon the word of God will be deceived and overcome. Satan works with all deceivableness of unrighteousness to gain control of the children of men, and his deceptions will continually increase. But... He can gain his object only as men voluntarily yield to his temptations. Those who are earnestly seeking a knowledge of the truth and are striving to purify their souls through obedience, thus doing what they can to prepare for the conflict, will find in the truth of God a sure defence. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee, Revelation 3.10 says, is the Saviour's promise. He would sooner send every angel out of heaven to protect his people than leave one soul that trusts in him to be overcome by Satan. End of quote. And that brings us to our two discussion questions this week. One, What subtle, spiritualistic influences might Satan be using to influence the mind? What role does mass media play? Two, how would you share your faith with a friend who just lost a loved one and believed that this person was in heaven? What is appropriate to say and what is not appropriate to say? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Unreached Town in Nigeria by Andrew McChesney The Nigerian town of Umacha is located at a strategic crossroads. The town boasts a big market that attracts daily crowds from neighbouring towns, but it lacked a Seventh-day Adventist church. The absence of an Adventist church was astonishing because Adventist churches had been established more than 70 years earlier in all of the surrounding towns. Even the headquarters of the Adventist church's Abba North Conference was located nearby, but Umacha had no church. Why? The first church opened in Umacha more than 80 years earlier, and it resolved to be the only church in town. As the years passed, however, townspeople sold their land to outsiders who, in turn, constructed their own churches. The oldest church accepted the newcomers, but all declared that Adventists who worshipped on a different day would never be welcome. Adventist churches in the neighbouring towns struggled to reach Umacha. When they sought to organise evangelistic meetings, no one would give them a meeting place. Hopes were raised when the church in nearby Emba conducted a two-week evangelistic meeting outside the town and afterward opened a branch Sabbath school. But the Sabbath school closed after only three months. Later, Emba young people held Bible studies that brought several Umacha families to the Emba church on Sabbaths. But the families stopped attending when their neighbours threw stones at them. In 2021, the Abba North Conference laid new plans for evangelistic meetings in Umacha, but again struggled to find a site. One landowner agreed to host tent meetings, but then abruptly changed his mind. Additional attempts provided unsuccessful that year and in 2022, and it seemed hopeless. Then a church member, Christian, made a new attempt to find a site. While searching, he met Chilaka, the owner of a school. You who are running around, what are you looking for? The school owner asked. It seems that I am looking for you, Christian replied. After a discussion, the school owner offered the property for the meetings. Christian gratefully accepted. For a month, Adventist preachers proclaimed the word of God in Umacha. They were joined by a medical team that cared for the sick. In the end, 29 precious souls were baptised. And then someone donated land and an Adventist church opened in Umacha. Today the church is progressing to the glory of God, said Caleb Uchenna. On Yindi, evangelism directed for the Abba North Conference. God's timing is perfect, he added, pointing to Exodus 9 verse 5, which says, 
Then the Lord appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land, in the New King James Version. The Lord did just that in the town of Umachah. 